Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 263 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about how we caught the DC snipers. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In October 2002, the nation was on edge. Still reeling from the 9-11 attacks the year before, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., was wound up tight. And then, suddenly, people started dropping dead. They were being shot by an unknown sniper who seemed to choose them at random. Because of the beltway that goes around Washington, they're sometimes called the beltway sniper attacks, also the D.C. sniper attacks. And they received nonstop 24-7 news coverage for three weeks, terrifying the nation. Was this a new and frightening case of Islamic terrorism? Who were the D.C. snipers? And how were they finally caught? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, today's story is a true crime story, so what should we say to begin? Well, as always, we'll be keeping things clinical. We will not be focusing on gory details or hyping the fear factor. Uh, Sensitive listeners should be aware that we will very briefly be mentioning situations in which people were killed, but we're not going to be describing how they were wounded. We'll simply say this person was shot and then whether or not they survived. I remember this being all over the news at the time. I'm sure you do too, Dom. Um... There was just constant, nonstop, hour-by-hour coverage of this by the cable news channels. Now, I was out here in California at the time, and the news media really had people scared all over the country, including in California on the other side of the continent. I remember the constant 24-7 coverage of it on TV, but as tragic as these events were, they were confined to a very small area. So people in the vast bulk of the country were not under threat. And today, the event is over. It's almost uh, 21 years later. Events like this are very rare. This is really the only one of its kind I can remember. So people today do not need to be worried about this. Also, this mystery has been solved. So most of today's episode will be relating the mystery as it unfolded revealing much of what was known to law enforcement at the time. However, there's a whole additional side to the mystery that has not been reported in the press, and we will be discussing that aspect of the case next week. So this week, we'll tell you the public story of what happened, and next week, we'll tell you a secret behind-the-scenes aspect of the story that almost nobody knows about, and that would blow many people's minds. So you'll want to listen to that. Also, I want to point out an additional aspect of our story. Here on Mysterious World, I try to be fair and unbiased in all the stories we cover. And sometimes that means covering stories that cover malfeasance in government and law enforcement circles, where government officials and police did bad things. But I don't have an anti-government or anti-police bias. I recognize that they're human beings like the rest of us. Some people in government and law enforcement are bad, but many are good. And today's story is positive towards government and especially law enforcement. Today, in this story, they are the good guys. Uh, So I just want to point out that aspect of the story and how it provides balance to some of the other stories we've covered. Let's talk about where America was when today's mystery began. What should we know? October of 2002 was a very tense time in America. Just a year before the 9-11 attacks had occurred, uh, we talked about them in episode 171 and again in episode 172. Of the four planes that were hijacked, two brought down the Twin Towers in New York City, but the other two were aimed at targets in Washington, D.C., One of them struck the Pentagon, and our best information indicates that Flight 93, the final plane, was going to crash into the U.S. Capitol building, where the House of Representatives and the Senate meet. So it could have killed a lot of government officials, a lot of Congress people in a single stroke. 
but a heroic passenger rebellion on the plane brought it down in Pennsylvania, so it never reached its target. Knowing that the nation's capital had been targeted by international terrorists, there was a lot of concern that they would strike again, and there was a lot of fear that Washington in particular would be struck by the terrorists again. Then, just a few weeks after 9-11, a series of anthrax attacks began, which we'll talk about in the future. In these attacks, someone started mailing letters with weaponized anthrax to people, including U.S. senators. So the terrorists kind of did strike again, including in Washington, and there were fears that they would keep doing so. The public was also in a state of tension because there were concerns that the leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, had weapons of mass destruction, including bioweapons, that he either had a hand in 9-11 or that he might use these weapons of mass destruction against America in the future. And the Bush administration was laying the groundwork for the invasion of Iraq, which would begin in March 2003, just six months after today's story, so the nation was being transitioned onto a war footing. There were concerns about hidden terrorist cells in the United States, like the ones that carried out the 9-11 attacks. And in the early years after 9-11, there were a series of what appeared to be lone wolf terrorist attacks, along with public concerns that the government was not being honest about these and was downplaying the idea that they were terrorist attacks, even though that's exactly what they appeared to be. So, America was under a huge amount of stress at the time. When does today's mystery begin? On Wednesday, October 2nd, 2002, in Aspen Hill in Montgomery County, Maryland, just north of Washington, D.C. At 5.20 p.m., a shot was fired through the window of a Michael's Craft store. Fortunately, it did not hit anyone. However, in her book, 23 Days of Terror, Angie Cannon of U.S. News & World Report states that in the store, Ann Chapman had just finished ringing up a customer the night before, she told detectives, when she heard a sound like a large firecracker. At first, she thought it was a light bulb exploding, but then something whooshed past her ear, even poofed her hair a bit. It blew out the light at register number five, sailed through a few cardboard display stands, and finally lodged in the rear wall in the framing department. When she learned it was a bullet, it took Chapman hours before she could stop shaking. The first shot in a new series of terror attacks had been fired, and fortunately, it was a miss. Now, unfortunately, shootings occur all the time, so nobody suspected that this was the start of anything. Suspicions began to be aroused, though, just an hour later, at 6.30 p.m., when a second shot was fired at a shopper's food warehouse in nearby Wheaton, Maryland. The victim was 55-year-old James Martin, who had stopped at the store to pick up some snacks and sodas for his Methodist church's youth group. Here's some audio of a 9-11 call just after the shooting. I'm at shopper's food warehouse on Randolph Road, and a man just fell in the parking lot. There was a loud noise, but we're not sure if he was shot. The frightened caller was hiding behind her car clutching her five-year-old child. Is he bleeding? Yes. Where is he bleeding from? I, I don't know. I'm like half an aisle away from him. Is it inside? No, it's outside in a parking lot. Oh, there's a police officer here now. And a police officer just happened to be passing the scene, so he arrived immediately. But it was too late. Mr. Martin was killed, so the second shot caused the first fatality. With two shootings so close to each other in time and space, certain police officials began to suspect that something was up, but they didn't know for sure. The next day, all doubts would be dispelled. On Thursday, October 3rd, the third shot was fired at 7.41 a.m. near Rockville, Maryland. The target was a 39-year-old former landscaper named James L. Buchanan, but he was popularly known as Sonny. Sonny was mowing the grass as a favor for a longtime client, which was a family-run auto dealership. He was killed, so the count was three shots, two fatalities, one miss. 31 minutes later, at 8.12 a.m., the fourth shot was fired in Aspen Hill, Maryland. The target was a 54-year-old part-time taxi driver 
named Prem Kuma Walikar. He was pumping gas at the time of, of his shooting, and he was also killed. Four shots, three fatalities, one miss. 25 minutes later, at 8.37 a.m., the fifth shot was fired at the Leisure World Shopping Center in Norbeck, Maryland. The target was a 34-year-old babysitter and housekeeper named Sarah Ramos, who was an immigrant from El Salvador. She was sitting on a bench, reading a book, and waiting to be picked up for work. She was killed. Five shots, four fatalities, one miss. And the police received a tip that could help them find the killers. We had a witness who had seen a white panel truck in the area where uh, the victim up at Leisure World had been. Uh, apparently, this witness had heard the shot, turned around, and saw that white panel truck. Suddenly, it seemed as if white vans and panel trucks were everywhere. Specifically, the police were told that it was a white box truck with dark lettering on the side. Police began scrutinizing any vehicles of this description, and as the announcer noted, they suddenly seemed to be everywhere. Normally we don't notice them, but now people did. An hour and 21 minutes later, at 9.58 a.m., the sixth shot was fired in Kensington, Maryland. The target was a 25-year-old named Lori Ann Lewis Rivera. She was vacuuming out her minivan at a gas station, and she was killed. Six shots, five fatalities, one miss. At this point, it would have been clear to the police that something was definitely up. Four people had just been killed in close proximity in a space of just over two hours. Yes, and the police now realized that they had a very big problem on their hands. And they linked the shootings that morning to the two of the previous day. So they knew that five people had already been killed in total. They didn't know when the killers would strike next, but given how closely spaced the morning shootings had been, they were on high alert, fearing that a new shooting could occur at any moment. In actuality, they would have to wait because no new shootings occurred that morning. It was not until later in the day, almost 12 hours later, at 9.20 p.m., that the seventh shot would be fired. The seventh shooting took place in Washington, D.C. itself. The target was a 72-year-old former carpenter named Pascal Charlotte. He, originally from Haiti, Charlotte was out for a walk when he was struck, and he was killed. Seven shots, six fatalities, one miss. And there was a new report that contradicted the earlier one about what the killer was driving. But after the Washington, D.C. shooting, witnesses tell police they saw a different type of car. Chief Moose was asked, is there something to a report that we received from an eyewitness about a Caprice or a late model Caprice, a dark car? The police sort of knocked it down. As a result, news reports barely mention the Caprice. In her book, 23 Days of Terror, author Angie Cannon provides more detail on what the witness reported. A witness told police he had seen a dark, older model four-door Chevrolet Caprice, burgundy or brown with dark-tinted windows. Another witness described it as an American-made, big, police-looking car, square-shaped and dark in color. The second witness had seen the car parked along the buildings in the 7800 block of Georgia Avenue Northwest. About 10 minutes later, that person heard a single gunshot from the area where the car was parked. Then that witness saw the car pull away, its lights off, traveling slowly west in the 1100 block of Calmia Road. The first witness also saw the car traveling west on Calmia with its lights off seconds after the shot. But this tip would be almost entirely ignored, and the police, the press, and the public continued to look for a white box truck. How was the public reacting to the situation now that it was clear that the shootings were connected and there was an active spree killer on the loose? People naturally panicked, and this didn't all happen immediately, but people started taking precautions. Wikipedia explains, Fear quickly spread throughout the region as news of the shooting spread. At a press conference meeting, Chief of Police from Montgomery County, Charles Moose, informed parents that schools were on a code blue alert, keeping children indoors. He said that the schools were safe. 
Many parents picked up their children early at school, not allowing them to take a school bus or walk home. Montgomery County Public Schools, District of Columbia Public Schools, and private schools went into a lockdown with no recess or outdoor physical education classes. Other school districts in the area also took precautionary measures, keeping students indoors. Also, in coming days, additional precautions would be taken. For example, since some of the victims had been shot at gas stations, gas stations started putting up large tarpaulins to block the street view of the pumps. That way, it would be harder for the killer to get a line of sight on their customers and thus make it harder to shoot them. Another thing that happened was the guardian angels started maintaining a presence in public locations like gas stations. They even pumped gas for people so that customers could stay in their cars. The guardian angels are a nonprofit volunteer group that conducts citizens patrols. They're famous for wearing red berets and red jackets. They don't carry weapons and they make citizens arrests. The Guardian Angels were originally founded in 1979 in New York City to help prevent violent crime on the New York subway system, and they were rather controversial since they were not part of the police. I remember at the time some people just accusing them of being irresponsible vigilantes, but they're still around, and people were somewhat reassured when they started maintaining a presence once the D.C. area shooting started and more people were willing to stop and have gas pumped for them by the angels. Yeah, it's, it's been picking up steadily since uh, I think this is getting out in the media, and uh, it's showing that, uh, you know, that there's somebody here to help the people that are afraid to do this. With all of these attacks occurring in the Washington, D.C. area, was there any response from the federal government, or did they leave it entirely up to local authorities to comment? The FBI definitely got involved, as well as the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and the U.S. Secret Service. And President George W. Bush also tried to reassure the public. First of all, I'm just sick, sick to my stomach to think that there is a cold-blooded killer at home taking innocent life. I weep for those who've lost their loved ones. I am, con I, you know, the idea of moms taking their kids to school and sheltering them from a potential sniper attack is, is not the American I know. Well, first of all, it is a form of terrorism, but in terms of the terrorism that we think of, we have no evidence one way or the other, obviously. But anytime anybody is randomly shooting, randomly killing, randomly taking life, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's cold-blooded murder, and it's, uh, you know, it's a sick mind. It's obviously loves terrorizing society. You'll notice that President Bush was rather guarded on the issue of terrorism. With the 9-11 attacks just a year earlier, people were really concerned about whether this might be some new al-Qaeda or other Middle Eastern terrorist plot. And he stated accurately that there was no evidence one way or the other about whether that was the case. He did acknowledge that the random shootings were terrorizing people, so they were terrorist in that sense, but that didn't prove that they were linked to radical Islam from the Middle East. Of course, not everybody was satisfied by that. Some people in the early years after 9-11 were concerned that the government was downplaying Muslim terrorist attacks here in the U.S. and passing them off as just random shooters, either out of political correctness or to keep the public from feeling constantly besieged by Muslim terrorists or for the sake of international and intelligence relationships with Muslim nations. But Bush was correct that at this early stage, there's, it simply wasn't known whether this was the case. We've now covered Thursday, October 3rd, the second day of the shootings. When did the next attack occur? The very next day, Friday, October 4th, at 2.30 p.m., the eighth shot was fired at a mall in Spotsylvania, Virginia. So the killer had now crossed into a new state. The first six attacks were in Maryland. The seventh was in Washington, D.C., and the eighth was south of Washington in Virginia. The target was a 43-year-old homemaker named Caroline Sewell. She was loading parcels into her minivan, and where she was doing this was significant. It was the parking lot of another Michael's Craft Store, just like the very first shooting. So maybe the killer had some kind of hang-up about Michael's. The police thus began considering whether he might be a disgruntled Michael's employee or something. Fortunately, this target, Mrs. Sewell, survived being shot. So, 
eight shots, six fatalities, one survivor, and one miss. By this point, the local schools were taking steps to protect the children by not letting them go outside, and Police Chief Charles Moose of Montgomery County had assured the public that the schools were safe, at least at the moment. Did that remain the case? Well, we were now up to the weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, the 5th and 6th. So the schools were closed and the children were at least temporarily safe. In fact, there were no attacks at all over the weekend, so everyone was safe. But the ninth shot was fired on Monday, October 7th at 8.09 a.m. in Bowie, Maryland. And it was at Benjamin Tasker Middle School. The target was 13-year-old Iran Brown. He was being dropped off at school by his aunt, who was a nurse, and she was still there. So she got him back in the car and raced him to the hospital. As a result, Iran survived. Nine shots, six fatalities, two survivors, and one miss. Since Chief Moose had so recently reassured the people that the schools were safe for the moment, did people see any connection between this statement and the fact that the very next target was a child? Yeah, they did. Uh, People thought that the killer must have been monitoring the media, and he took the remark about schools as a challenge and decided to target one to prove that nobody was safe. People would have a couple of days to contemplate this because the next attack wouldn't be until two days later. But the killer would not continue to target schools and returned to targeting adults in public places. At this point, the police found a new clue in the woods near Irene Brown's school. What was that? A tarot card. Specifically, it was the death card. Tarot cards started as early decks of ordinary playing cards in the 1440s and 1450s, around the same time that the printing press was invented, and people used them just to play games. The modern 52-card deck of playing cards is basically the same as the part of a tarot deck known as the Minor Arcana. But games involve random processes, and humans love to use random processes to foretell the future. So eventually, people started using tarot playing cards to do tarot fortune telling. When they do that, the death card has a specific meaning, but it's not what you think. The death card does not signify literal physical death. Instead, it signifies a change is going to take place in a person's life. But The ordinary public doesn't know that, so the death card would be a really scary card to leave behind at the scene of a shooting. It wasn't just the card that the sniper had left behind, though. He also left behind a message, which was written on the card. On the top of the face of the card, it said, Call me God. And on the back of the card, it said, For you, Mr. Police. Code. Call me God. Do not release to the press. So this was a direct message to the police. The sniper apparently wanted to contact them in the future using the code call me God to identify himself and let the police know who they were talking to. He thus didn't want this information released to the press because then anybody in the public would know the code and its value would be ruined as a communications tool. Were the police able to keep this secret and open a line of communication with the killer? No, there were loads of reporters pestering law enforcement officials for information about the case, and the existence of the card leaked the very next day, being reported by TV station WUSA and by the Washington Post newspaper. And when the public heard about the tarot card, they wanted to know more about it, and many wanted to see it. When you have no idea who the guy is, and there's millions of people to choose from, keeping something secret doesn't do you much good because you'll never have anybody to prosecute anyway. So it's far better to go public with a piece of information so that the public can you know, say, turn around and say, oh, wait a minute, I know who owns those shoes. Wait a minute, I know who owns that knife. In this particular case, for example, with the the tarot card, they didn't want to go public and still have not shown it. Uh, If this is connected to the crime, this is the the best piece of information they have so far that would make him a different, you know, separate him from the crowd. And that would make a lot of sense if this were an ordinary piece of evidence. But what people didn't know is that the card had a communications code on it so that the killer could communicate with the police. 
with the killer reaching out to the police, that was a good sign. If they could open a dialogue with him, they might be able to negotiate an end to the killings. And at a minimum, they could learn more about the killer and use that information to catch him. But that meant keeping the code secret and not releasing information about the card to the press. Yet now, because of the leak from someone on the task force, the killer might think that the police were unwilling to keep his terms or uninterested in communicating with him. Angie Cannon explains, The existence of the tarot card was first reported by WUSA Channel 9. The Washington Post reported it in Wednesday's editions. Detectives feared the leak would harm their chances of developing a relationship with the shooter so they could communicate with him. I think these nuts were amazed, one said, at how much was getting out to the press. Chief Moose was livid. At a press conference on Wednesday, October 9th, he tore into the media. I have not received any messages that the citizens of Montgomery County want Channel 9 or the Washington Post or any other media outlet to solve this case, he said. If they do, then let me know. We will go and do other police work and we will turn this case over to the media and you can solve it. Moose may have been hot enough to spit tax, but he also wanted to use the media to send a message to the shooter that he wasn't the one who released information about the tarot card. The card had contained a warning not to divulge its existence to the press. Moose realized the importance of establishing a conversation with the shooter and felt he needed to show him he had not been the one to go against his wishes. And that was a good move on Chief Moose's part, making a public show of anger at the leak about the card to show the killer that he wasn't the one who did it. The tenth shot was fired on Wednesday, October 9th at 8.53 p.m. The location was a Sunoco gas station near the city of Manassas, Virginia. The target was a 53-year-old civil engineer named Dean Harold Myers, and he died. Ten shots, seven fatalities, two survivors, one miss. The next attack would follow in another two days. Let's talk about the state of the investigation that law enforcement was conducting. They'd had 10 shootings at this point. What had they learned? One of the things that made this case hard was that there was no apparent connection between the victims. They still all appear to be random victims, don't appear to be anyone's enemy, don't appear to be involved in anything coordinated, just simply random targets. And the targets did seem to be random. They didn't fit any particular profile. Some of them were men, like James Martin and Sonny Buchanan. Some of them were women, like Sarah Ramos and Lorianne Lewis Rivera. Some of them were young and some were elderly. Um, Iran Brown was 13, while Pascal Charlotte was 72. And they were of different races. Caroline Sewell was white. Pascal Charlotte was black. Sarah Ramos was Hispanic. Prim Kumar Walekar was Indian, and Iran Brown was mixed race. Demographically, they were very diverse, so it didn't look like the killer was targeting people from one demographic category. The victims also weren't tied to any particular business, religion, political party, social club, or hobby. The only thing they had in common was that they were in public places at the time of the shootings. Two of them had been shot in front of Michael's craft stores, but only two of them, so they looked like randomly chosen victims. Whoever shot them must have been a really good marksman. You've been keeping the statistics, and out of 10 shots, there were nine casualties, including seven fatalities and two survivors. Each was shot only a single time, no multiple hits, and out of 10 shots, only one missed. Yeah, um, making that the point is the reason I've been keeping count. Eventually, the numbers will get up to 14 shots, only one of which will have been a miss. This level of accuracy suggested the sniper had good firearms training, meaning that he possibly had been in the military or the police or was a hunter. The police also looked at where he was shooting from. Since nobody saw him taking the shots, it was thought that he might be shooting from up on rooftops where he would be hard to see. But when they examined the angles of the bullets, they found that they were fired at the victims from ground level. And that led to a theory. Investigators began to believe that the sniper was shooting from a vehicle, 
which led to a theory that a pair of shooters might be involved. For the purposes of shooting, you want to have room available so you can have some mobility. And that means when you're behind the wheel, you don't have that kind of mobility. So because the shots were coming from ground level, but nobody saw a shooter on the ground, that suggested he might be shooting from within a vehicle. And if you just shot someone from a vehicle, you'd want to drive away immediately and escape the scene, which would suggest a second person in the car as a driver. It's not common to have two people working as a team of shooting in shooting sprees, but it does happen, and they thought it might be happening here. Specifically, they thought it might be a man and a woman who were teamed up, with the man, who was the dominant figure, taking the shots and the woman serving as the driver. Could they determine any other likely characteristics of the sniper? Law enforcement developed a profile of the sniper, but they didn't have a lot of confidence in it, so they didn't release it to the public. They were concerned that if the profile was wrong, it would cause the public to fixate on the wrong suspects and hamper the investigation. However, as part of the 24-7 news coverage the cable channels were giving this, they needed to fill airtime, so they interviewed all kinds of supposed experts who speculated at length on what the sniper might be like. One of the things they proposed was that the sniper was likely a white male. It's not unlikely to think that the sniper might be a white male because there are a lot of white males in this country. But the argument was that he was probably a white male on the grounds that most mass shooters are white males. We'll have more to say about the nature of crime statistics on this point later on, but I have to say that I think there was an element of, politi of political correctness here. America was still reeling from the 9-11 attacks. Osama bin Laden had been urging jihadists around the world to attack people in the West. We'd had al-Qaeda cells operating covertly in the United States, and the government was constantly warning about radical Islamists attacking soft targets in America like people with, in public places. So what was on the minds of lots of people in America was, could this be another cell of Middle Eastern terrorists doing the shootings, or could it be someone inspired by Middle Eastern terrorists? But lots of talking heads on TV kept assuring the public it would be a white male, a man of European ancestry. And that's a pattern we've seen a good bit in recent years, whenever a shooting happens or a bomb goes off, the media has a tendency to rush to a right-wing militia angry white male stereotype, even when it turns out that the people that the perpetrator wasn't a white male or right-wing, because there have been multiple left-wing shooters. And the assumption shooters must be angry right-wing white males is due to political correctness and stereotyping, but the idea has persisted in the media. While the investigation was underway, when did the attacks resume? The 11th shot was fired on Friday, October 11th at 9.30 a.m. The location was an Exxon gas station near Fredericksburg, Virginia. The target was 53-year-old businessman Kenneth Bridges. He did not survive. 11 shots, 8 fatalities, 2 survivors, 1 miss. There was then another weekend without attacks. The 12th shot was fired on Monday, October 14th at 9.15 p.m. The location was the parking lot of a Home Depot hardware store outside Falls Church, Virginia. The target was a 47-year-old FBI intelligence analyst named Linda Franklin. She did not survive. 12 shots, 9 fatalities, 2 survivors, 1 miss. But the police received what looked like a promising tip from another Home Depot customer named Matthew Dowdy. Matthew Dowdy said he was walking out of the hardware store when he saw the killer. A uh, Mideastern style male, complected, crouching down, taking a shot. He described a white or cream colored van with a burnt out rear light. An alert went out to the public. So this could be very helpful. The white or cream-colored van sounded like uh, the previous reports of a white box truck. 
Uh, he said it was a Chevy van. The burned out taillight could make it much easier to identify which vehicle needed to be investigated. And the Middle Eastern man taking a sh the shot fit in with many people's suspicion that this was Middle Eastern Islamic terrorism. So all that sounded very promising. And they notified the public to be on the lookout for this vehicle and individual. But there was more to the story, as law enforcement discovered in reviewing the Home Depot's security camera footage. Two days later, a detective was reviewing the surveillance tapes from the hardware store. At 9.21 p.m., Dowdy appeared on the in-store security videotape, three minutes after the shooting. When they realized that this was a, a false lookout and that uh, false suspect information. The eyewitness turned out to be a hoax, just someone looking for media attention. So Matthew Doughty was a liar. He just wanted to insert himself into a dramatic national story and get his 15 minutes of fame. He wasted the police and the public's time and harmed the investigation by sending them off on a wild goose chase. Meanwhile, the killers were trying to reach out and make contact with the police. Having established the Call Me God code on the tarot card for identification purposes. At 4.35 p.m. on Tuesday, October 15th, they called the Rockville Police Department in Rockville, Maryland. Rockville City Police, love calls, the sign is recorded. Good morning. Don't say anything, just listen. Where are the people that are causing the killing in your area? We look on the tarot card. It says, Call Me God. Sir? Any Get your people. Out Montgomery County Police Hotline. We're not investigating the crime. Do you like the number? And the killer hung up. Now, to my mind, this was just rock stupid on the part of the police dispatcher. It's an illustration of the typical lazy bureaucratic mindset. Our department isn't tasked with investigating all the local citizens being terrorized and killed, so it's not our problem to deal with. If you're in the middle of a, of a nationally famous killing spree and the killer calls you on the phone, talk to him and keep him on the phone as long as possible. Trace the call. Find out what he wants. Negotiate. Get information you could use to catch him. Keep him talking. Sheesh. You know, people seem to think that I'm a pretty patient man, but they don't see me when I'm having to talk to lazy bureaucratic people, whether they're working for the government or some big corporation who are unwilling to use common sense if it means deviating from procedure. Bureaucracy really gets my goat, and I swiftly become unpatient with them. To quote the playwright David Mamet, Any of us who has ever been at a zoning meeting with our property at stake is aware of the urge to cut through all the pernicious BS and go straight to firearms. And that's how a lot of people feel when dealing with lazy bureaucrats. Anyway, in this case, I thought what the dispatcher did was rock stupid. We now were coming up on the two-week anniversary of the first shooting. Did anything happen to mark that occasion? No, the attacks actually stopped for the longest period so far. For whatever reason, there were no more attacks for five whole days. However, on Thursday, October 17th, the killers tried to contact the police again. In fact, this time they tried twice on the same day, calling Montgomery County the Montgomery County Police Department at 4.35 p.m. and 5.40 p.m. Angie Cannon explains, Sergeant Derek Belisles picked up the receiver. The man on the other end of the line was a mess, pumping coins into the payphone. I am God, the man roared. Don't you know who you're dealing with? Just check out the murder robbery in Montgomery if you don't believe me. Belisles listened, confused. There'd been no murder robbery in the county recently. Just the sniper shootings, and none of those involved robbery. Next, the caller rambled on about a Sergeant Martino. The name didn't mean a thing to Belisles. Was the caller just another nut, a crackpot, impelled to get into the act by the endless sniper news? Belisles waited for more, but there was none. The line went dead. And remember the mention of Montgomery and Sergeant Martino, because those names will come back in our story. They didn't mean anything to Sergeant Belisles, but they're important. 
The same day, the police also received an interesting tip from a man all the way across the country in Tacoma, Washington. As Robert Holmes watched the coverage of the D.C. sniper shootings, he had an alarming revelation. He somehow has this gut feeling that his friend John Muhammad is behind this. John Muhammad had been his buddy in the army. He owned a long-range rifle, just like the one shown in the news reports. And here was the clincher. John had an estranged wife who had taken custody of their children and moved to the Washington, D.C. area. So he calls the tip line, and his tip gets completely lost. What's more, Angie Cannon reports, he had seen his friend just three months earlier in Tacoma with a black male he referred to as his son. The youth, Holmes guessed, was about 18, and Muhammad had christened him with a nickname, Sniper. So when he had visited a few months earlier, Holmes' friend John Muhammad had been traveling with a young man he referred to as his son, and he'd even nicknamed him Sniper. The two were traveling around with a long-range rifle, and Muhammad had told him that he was heading to Washington, D.C. to look for his estranged wife, Mildred. Kind of hard not to see a connection when a sniper starts shooting up the Washington, D.C. area. Unfortunately, his tip didn't receive any attention. Uh, They wrote it down, but there were over 100,000 tips that had come into the tip line. All kinds of people were phoning in with ideas about who the killers might be, and law enforcement officials were simply overwhelmed in dealing with them. The next day, Friday the 18th, the killers made another call. Having been frustrated in getting through to the police, they decided to see if someone else would listen to them, and they called St. Anne's Catholic Church in Ashland, Virginia. Sitting in the church rectory, Monsignor William Sullivan listened closely. Very briefly, there was the voice of an older man. Here, someone wants to talk to you, he told the priest. He then quickly handed the receiver to someone much younger. That person was ranting. The priest could barely understand him. It was the younger of the two who did most of the talking. He had a peculiar accent, but the priest was unable to place it. I am God, the younger caller said. He repeated the phrase several times, ordering the priest to write his words down and communicate them to the police. Write this down. If the police didn't believe what he was saying, the caller told the police they should check out a shooting near St. Anne Street in Montgomery. Then he paused. Alabama, the caller added. The priest thought the call was a crank. This call was important for two reasons. First, it established that there were two killers, so the idea that a team was at work was confirmed. But instead of a man and a woman, it was an older man and a younger man. Second, we got more information about the significance of Montgomery. It wasn't Montgomery County, Maryland, which the police officer they previously spoke with had naturally assumed. Instead, it was the city of Montgomery, Alabama. And there apparently had been a shooting there near St. Anne Street, but the task force didn't know that yet. During this general time period, the killers also tried calling others. They apparently called the FBI task force at an 800 number four times. They tried calling CNN, but they didn't make progress in in establishing a line of communication. The 13th shot was fired on Saturday, October 19th, making this the first time one occurred on a weekend. It occurred in the parking lot of the Ponderosa Steakhouse in Ashland, Virginia, 90 miles south of Washington, making this the furthest one out so far. The target was a 37-year-old man named Jeffrey Hopper. Fortunately, his wife Stephanie was there, and she yelled to a passerby who called for an ambulance. So, Mr. Hopper survived. Thirteen shots, nine fatalities, three survivors, one miss. And in the wake of the Ponderosa shooting, the killers finally were able to establish a line of communication with the authorities. At 9.40 a.m. Sunday, October 20th, the sniper called the FBI tip line and directed police to carefully inspect the woods near the Ponderosa. There, he said, they would find a note. Investigators had already discovered it the night before. The note was four pages long and had been placed in a plastic bag tacked to a tree outside the restaurant. 
A local investigator and an FBI agent jumped on a state police helicopter bound for the FBI lab in Washington. There, the note was opened in the wee hours of the morning. Technicians processed it, checking for fingerprints, possible fibers, and DNA evidence. Was there any sweat, blood, saliva, skin, or hair on the note? The lab sent a copy of the note back to Hanover County. It was there by 8.30 Sunday morning. The snipers had given a 6 a.m. deadline for when they would contact police. But the FBI techs were handling the evidence with care so they didn't contaminate any DNA evidence. So the cops missed the deadline. The handwriting would be compared with the writing on the tarot card. The examination conducted by the U.S. Secret Service Crime Laboratory's questioned document branch. The conclusion? Both almost certainly had been penned by the same hand. The neat block printing on the first page of the note was surrounded by five stars. Not surprisingly, the whole thing was riddled with spelling and punctuation errors. Now, the note contains a bunch of repetitions, phone numbers, dates, and addresses, but here's a simplified version of what the note said. For you, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not release to the press. We have tried to contact you to start negotiation, but the incompetence of your forces in 1. Montgomery Police Officer Derek, 2. Rockville Police Department Female Officer, 3. Task Force FBI Female four times, 4. Priest at Ashland, 5. CNN Washington, D.C. These people took of calls for a hoax or joke, so your failure to respond has cost you five lives. If stopping the killing is more important than catching us now, then you will accept our demand, which are non-negotiable. One, you will place $10 million in Bank of America account number blank, Platinum Visa account. We will have unlimited withdrawal at any ATM worldwide. You will activate the bank account, credit card, and PIN number. We will contact you at Ashland, Virginia, Ponderosa Buffet, 6 a.m. Sunday morning. You have until 9 a.m. Monday morning to complete transaction. Try to catch us withdrawing, at least you will have less body bags. But, 2. If trying to catch us now more important than prepare you body bags, if we give you our word, that is what takes place. Word is bond. P.S. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. So the killers wanted $10 million deposited in a Bank of America Visa account. The account belonged to a credit card they had stolen from a bus driver in Arizona way back in March, and after the card was stolen, the account was deactivated. But they wanted it to be reactivated along with unlimited withdrawal privileges so they could pull out as much of the $10 million as they wanted any time they wanted. They promised more deaths if they didn't get their way, and they warned that children were not safe, so they threatened them specifically. Law enforcement also contacted Monsignor Sullivan of St. Anne's Church in Ashland to check up on the phone call he reported and see if there was anything to it. Since it was a Sunday, they had to wait until he finished saying Mass to speak with him. They thus learned that there were two killers, an older gentleman and a younger man, and that the younger man had boasted about a killing near St. Anne Street in Montgomery, Alabama. The police felt they were finally getting somewhere. Chief Moose also called an impromptu press conference at 7 p.m. in which he said, To the person who left us a message at the Ponderosa last night, you gave us a telephone number. We do want to talk to you. Call us at the number you provided. So now the police were reciprocating on the communications issue and clearly signaled the killers that they wanted to talk. The task force also made contact with police in Montgomery, Alabama, and asked if there had been a shooting near St. Anne Street. And there had been. Almost exactly a month before, on September 21st, there had been a robbery in which two people were shot that fit the murder robbery that the killers had mentioned on the phone to Sergeant Derek Belisles. And there was a Sergeant Martino on the Montgomery, Alabama police force. So that explained who he was. Furthermore, a magazine had been dropped at the crime scene. It had a fingerprint on it, but local officials said they had not processed the print. The magazine was immediately flown to Washington. And lo and behold, the fingerprint matches Lee Boy Malvo. 
Lee Boyd Malvo was a 17-year-old illegal immigrant from Jamaica, and the fingerprint they found on the magazine from the Montgomery, Alabama crime scene matched his immigration records from when he'd been temporarily detained by immigration authorities. So now the police had two names to investigate, John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo. Now, you'll recall that the previous night, Chief Moose had asked the killers to call the phone number they had indicated in their note, and at 7.57 a.m. on Monday, October 21st, they did. Is this the Ponderosa? Um, who is this? Don't say anything. Just listen. The voice on the phone told the police to follow the demands from the note or more people would be killed. They were to tell the press that the sniper had been caught like a duck in a noose. It ended with a chilling warning. P.S. Your children are not safe. The call was routed immediately to the FBI negotiations team at the Montgomery County Command Post. The call lasted 38 seconds. It was jumbled, the words hard to decipher. He instructed police to listen and repeated the Call Me God introduction. He reminded the FBI negotiator that their terms were non-negotiable and repeated the threat to children. Police immediately traced the call to a payphone at the Exxon gas station in Glen Allen, Virginia, and raced to the scene. There was a white van parked by the payphone, and there were two men in it. They were immediately taken into custody. But it turned out they were not the snipers. Law enforcement had apparently missed the snipers by only minutes, and the two men in custody were illegal immigrants, one from Mexico and one from Guatemala. They were turned over to immigration authorities, and they were later deported back to their home countries. Unfortunately, the call that had come in from the killers had been hard to understand, so at 4 p.m., Chief Moose went before the press again. The person you called could not hear everything that you said. The audio was unclear, and we want to get it right. Call us back so that we can clearly understand. Unfortunately, there would be more tragedy just around the corner. The 14th shot was fired on Tuesday, October 22nd at 5.56 a.m. The location was the site of a street in Aspen Hill, Maryland, where the first attack was. So after having gone far south for the 13th attack, they now returned to the town where it all started. The target was a 35-year-old bus driver named Conrad Johnson. He was from Jamaica and he was standing on the steps of his bus, preparing for the day when he was hit. He did not survive. Fourteen shots, ten fatalities, three survivors, one miss. Putting that another way, out of fourteen shots, we had thirteen casualties and one miss. By this point, the idea that the recent note had contained some kind of threat had leaked out. The reason was that the police had shared, in very general terms, with school authorities, that there had been some kind of threat, so they could decide whether they wanted to hold classes or not. And given the vagueness of the threat, which had been made before, without it being followed up on, they did decide to hold classes, though they wouldn't be letting the children outside in order to keep them safe. But school authorities then leaked the fact that there had been a threat of some kind, and that led to pressure being put on the police to say what the threat was. After a lot of internal debate, they decided to do so. The debate was because the note had said, don't release it to the press, and they didn't want to sever their new communications channel with the snipers. But because of the public uproar, they decided to release just the language of the threat. And so, at 4.30 p.m., Chief Moose went before the cameras. There continues to be a great deal of speculation as to a reference, a threat in the message previously received. We recognize the concerns of the community and therefore are going to provide the exact language in the message that pertains to the threat. It is in the form of a postscript. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. Also that afternoon, law enforcement found another note from the killers near the site of the shooting. This one said, For you, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not release to the press. You did not respond to the message. 
You departed from what we told you to say, and you departed from the time. Your incompetence has cost you another life. You have until 9 a.m. to deliver the money and 8 a.m. to deliver this response. We have caught the sniper like a duck in a noose, not, to let us know you have our demands. So the killers were setting a new deadline for law enforcement and threatening to take another life to force them to come through with the $10 million for the stolen visa account. They also reiterated the message from the phone call that they needed to say they had caught the sniper like a duck in a noose. A little after 7 p.m., Chief Moose then went before the cameras yet again. In the past several days, you have attempted to communicate with us. We have researched the option you stated and found that it is not possible electronically to comply in the manner that you requested. However, We remain open and ready to talk to you about the options you have mentioned. It is important that we do this without anyone else getting hurt. Call us at the same number you used before to obtain the 800 number that you have requested. So without mentioning the $10 million, which was mentioned in a note the snipers had said shouldn't be given to the press, Chief Moose indicated that they had had investigated the possibility of transferring the money into the account electronically and have it be withdrawn from anywhere in the world, but they couldn't find a way to do this, though they still were open to talking about the matter and they didn't want anybody killed. What about the duck in the noose part? This duck in a noose thing was really weird, and the police didn't want any more people killed, so the next day, Wednesday the 23rd, Chief Moose went before the cameras again. We understand that you communicated with us by calling several different locations. Our inability to talk has been a concern for us, as it has been for you. You have indicated that you want us to do and say certain things. You asked us to say, quote, we have caught a sniper, like a duck in a noose, end quote. We understand that hearing us say this is important to you. That's such a weird phrase. Any idea why it was important to the snipers for the police to say this? It's believed that the phrase is a reference to a Cherokee legend. The Los Angeles Times explains, The last cryptic message from Montgomery County, Maryland, Police Chief Charles A. Moose to the Washington area sniper referred to a Cherokee Indian story about an arrogant rabbit that was duped by the duck he tried to catch. The ancient story has been passed down through generations of Cherokees. In it, a rabbit brags that he can catch a duck. He throws a noose over the neck of a duck, but it flies away with the rabbit hanging on. Eventually, the rabbit must let go, landing in a hollow tree stump. The conceited animal has to eat his own fur for food and is embarrassed by his appearance when he finally escapes. His boastfulness got him in trouble and eventually destroyed him, said Tara Shows, spokeswoman for the Cherokee Nation, based in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The rabbit is a trickster that always gets himself in trouble by his own devices, Chad Smith, principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, said in a statement. So apparently the phrase was kind of a covert dig at the police. They were like the rabbit who thought he'd caught a duck in a noose, only to end up embarrassing himself and getting harmed, while the snipers themselves were like the duck that escapes the noose and gets away scot-free. At least that seems to have been what it means. At the same time as the press conference where they said the duck in a noose line, there were new developments underway. What was going on? The duck in a noose line wasn't the only thing that Chief Moose said at the press conference. By this time, authorities were fairly confident that they knew who the two snipers were, John Muhammad and Lee Malvo, and they thought that they had identified the car they were using, a dark-colored Chevy Caprice with New Jersey plates. So they put out a BOLO, or Be On The Lookout alert, to law enforcement agencies. They then had a debate about how much of this to release to the public because they weren't entirely sure that Muhammad and Malvo were their guys, and they were afraid that if the snipers heard their names, car description, and license plate number given out in the media, that they'd just ditch the car, steal a new one, and vanish. So Chief Moose was extremely careful 
in what he said at the Duck in a News press conference. Chief Moose stepped in front of the TV cameras at 11.50 p.m. He did not mention that authorities were viewing Muhammad as a suspect in the sniper shootings. The police, the chief said, were merely looking to speak with him, although Muhammad was wanted in connection with other matters. Moose elaborated somewhat. Muhammad, the chief said, was armed and extremely dangerous. He was being sought for alleged violation of federal firearms laws. But the chief also added a strong word of caution. Do not assume from this allegation that John Allen Muhammad is involved in any of the shootings we are investigating. He said the warrant for Muhammad's arrest was not related to the recent shootings under investigation by the task force, but added that Muhammad may have information material to our investigation. Moose issued a photograph of a clean-shaven man with a cropped haircut. He described Muhammad as six foot one and 180 pounds and said he might be accompanied by a juvenile. Just before the midnight press conference, word of all this had already leaked out to the press, including the names of the two men, their car description, and their license plate number. So word was out, and the press was running with it. All right, back live now. Let's talk briefly about this person that has now uh, been released publicly here, who police are looking for. Federal arrest warrant has been issued for this man. Take a look. He is 42-year-old John Allen Muhammad, also known as John Allen Williams. Again, 42 years old, about six foot tall, approximately 180 pounds. Now, the arrest warrant alleges violation of federal firearms laws, but it has been explained to us that these violations are in no way connected to the sniper attacks. This is something completely different, but authorities are telling us off camera that they strongly believe this person has some information that could be useful in the serial sniper investigation. We've also learned the vehicle that they're looking for, and let's show you what that looks like. It is a burgundy or blue Chevy sedan. It's a Caprice, it's a 1990 model with a New Jersey license plate. We've learned here on the scene that that does go back to a Clinton, Maryland address. You can see there what the license plate number is, NDA21Z. Again, it seems to go back to a Clinton, Maryland address, although it is a New Jersey license plate, but somehow the ownership has a Clinton, Maryland connection. We also want to tell you about another suspect. Police off camera are giving us his name and age, but they're not talking about what charge he may face. But it's 17-year-old Lee Malvo, who may be traveling with Muhammad. Again, he is a minor, so they're not publicly saying what charge he may be facing, but they do believe he is with this John Muhammad. I want to tell you that they believe he is armed and dangerous Muhammad. The press conference had been at midnight and around 1 a.m a supermarket refrigeration specialist named Whitney Donahue was driving home to Pennsylvania after working the night shift. He heard the information about the car on the radio, and he scribbled down the description and license plate on his timesheet. He also happened to own a Chevy Caprice himself, so he knew exactly what they looked like. It was quite a way back to Pennsylvania, and Donahue decided to take a break at a rest stop on I-70 west of Fredericks, Maryland. When he pulled into the rest stop, there were only two other cars present. One was a dark Chevrolet Caprice pulled backwards into a parking spot so that it could be started and driven away on a moment's notice. It had New Jersey plates, and it had the same license number. Donahue tells the story. I started scanning the cars as I went in towards the Beltway, and then I got on Route 70 and decided to stop at the rest area on South Mountain. And as I turned in, I seen the Caprice, it was dark blue, and then as I came on in, I could see the front tag, and it was what I had written down, and I pulled in right directly across in front of them, picked up my cell phone, and uh, called 911. So Donahue used his own vehicle to block the sniper car, which is a heroic thing to do. I mean, you're blocking in a murderous sniper with a gun. And he called the police. They then responded, and they did so very carefully. Muhammad and Malvo were asleep in the car, and rather than rushing in immediately, the police used their own vehicles to block all access points to the rest area. And then a SWAT team 
moved in to arrest them. I remember looking down at Malvo and seeing beads of sweat on his forehead. And this is October, it was cool, and he didn't say a word. And I looked down, walked over to John Muhammad, and I saw his face. He was angry. It was a quick operation, and everybody knew we had them, and everybody was relieved, and everybody was glad it was over. After three weeks of terror, the murder spree was finally over, and the public rejoiced. The next day, the Washington Times newspaper ran a picture of the two snipers with a gigantic single-word main headline, Caught. And before we get to the rest of this compelling story, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Gerard T., Buck and Julianne T., Mark A., Gwen L., and David B. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by... Tim Shevlin's Personal Fitness Training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness through personalized nutrition, workout and prayer programs, and daily accountability check-ins. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. So, Jimmy, what happened once Muhammad and Malvo were in custody? Well, the first thing that happened was Maryland and Virginia got to fight each other about who would get to prosecute them first because they committed crimes in both states. The investigation also revealed something interesting because they had modified the Chevy Caprice they were driving to make it easy to shoot people from. They had made it into, as some people put it, a rolling sniper's nest. They made an opening in the rear bumper just above the license plate That way, one of them could lie on their stomach and aim the rifle out of the hole. Then the other one, whoever was behind the wheel, could drive them away as soon as the shot was taken. There also was an investigation of the two men and what they'd been doing before the sniper spree. So let's back up a moment and talk about the two of them and their origin stories. Okay, first, let's talk about the older of the two, John Muhammad. Who was he? He was born John Allen Williams in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1960, so he was 42 years old at the time. His mother had died when he was little, and after that, his dad left. He was primarily raised by his maternal grandfather and an aunt. In 1978, at the age of 18, he joined the Louisiana National Guard, and he became a member of the U.S. Army in 1985, where he qualified as an expert rifleman. He fought in the Gulf War in 1991, and he was discharged in 1994. While he was in the army, he joined the Nation of Islam in 1987. The Nation of Islam is a religious organization we'll talk more about in future episodes. It combines aspects of Islamic thought with black nationalism, and it's got some really interesting beliefs. For example, the Nation of Islam holds that the, Bibli- that the biblical patriarch Jacob, or Yaqub, lived 6,600 years ago, which is way more than biblical scholars would say. They also believe he was a mad scientist who then used his mad science to create white people, as well as other races, in the process of trying to make white people. The white people were very uncivilized, but Moses taught them to wear clothes and tried to civilize them. Only they were so uncouth that he eventually gave up on this plan and blew up 300 white people with dynamite. Also, some white people tried to graft themselves back into the black nation, but not having anything to go by, their efforts went awry and they became gorillas, which is also where monkeys come from. So, biblical patriarch mad scientist making white people, Moses using dynamite, other races, gorillas, monkeys. Wow. In any event, John Williams got married twice and divorced twice. 
He and his second wife, Mildred Green Muhammad, had three children. He tried starting two businesses. The first was an auto mechanic shop and the second was a karate studio, but they both failed. In 1999, Mildred divorced him and got a restraining order against him because of threats he had made against her. Afterwards, John stole their children and went to the island of Antigua in the Caribbean, and it was while he was in the Caribbean that he met Lee Malvo. Then let's talk about him. Who was Lee Malvo? He was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and you'll hear his name different ways. Uh, sometimes he's called Lee Boyd Malvo, and sometimes he's called John Lee Malvo. Uh, he was born in 1985, his parents were not married, and he was raised by his mother, Una James. He also was partially raised by some of his aunts. He was very intelligent and did extremely well in school. He was baptized in Seventh-day Adventist Church, which his mother also was a member of. Eventually, the two of them went to Antigua, where they met John Williams in 1999. Una then left Lee in the care of John while she illegally immigrated to the United States, planning for Lee to follow her. But John began acting as a surrogate father for Lee and isolated him from his mother. He also converted Lee to Islam in March 2001. John then took his own children and Lee and went back to the United States, which meant he was bringing Lee illegally into the country. They went to Bellingham in the state of Washington, and there Lee and his mother were detained by immigration authorities. Lee was released on bond in January 2002 and returned to living with John, who he referred to as his father. John also had a new name. In October 2001, just the month after the 9-11 attacks, he had legally changed his name to Muhammad. So John Allen Williams became John Allen Muhammad. While he had gained a new name, he had also lost custody of his children. They were given back to the custody of their mother, Mildred, and she took them and moved to the Washington, D.C. area, enraging John. John and Lee then began living in a homeless shelter in Bellingham, but they decided to go on a crime spree. It began in February 2002, the month after Lee was released by immigration authorities. On February 16th, they shot a 21-year-old cashier named Kenya Nicole Cook. Kenya's aunt was a friend of John's ex-wife Mildred and had encouraged her to divorce him. They then began traveling to other states, Arizona, Louisiana, Maryland, Georgia, and Alabama, killing and shooting people as they went. This included the murder robbery they committed in Montgomery, Alabama on September 21st, that helped lead to their capture. So, actually, it was discovered the Washington, D.C. shooting spree was just the last phase of a much longer criminal escapade that had been going on since February 2002. That gives us some background on the two individuals. Now let's talk about a couple of other matters from the Reason perspective. The police were obviously misled by the early report connecting the shootings to a white box truck. And there was a lot of speculation that the shooter or shooters were white. How badly did this affect matters? If the police and the public failed to look at Muhammad and Malvo because they didn't fit this profile, their spree would have lasted longer than it otherwise would have. And more people may have died as a result of a bad profile. This is true, but we're dealing with a tricky situation. In a situation where you don't know who the perpetrator is, you need to make your best guess about who might be responsible. The trick is not treating that guess and the resulting profile as if it's gospel. You know, being willing to question the guess so that tunnel vision and confirmation bias don't set in. And in this case, the profile was based on the idea that most killers of this type are white, and that may be true. However, there are a couple of complicating factors. First, in what category should Muhammad and Malvo be put? Are they serial killers, spree killers, mass shooters? They displayed characteristics of more than one type of killer, so the answer isn't obvious. And the relevant statistics vary depending on which category you put them in. Second, it isn't clear what the relevant statistics are. I did some checking, and I found very different racial breakdowns. 
Uh, different sources said things that were mutually irreconcilable and thus couldn't possibly both be true. In some cases, it looked like the statistics were even being deliberately cooked to achieve certain outcomes. For example, I found a 2002 article by the Statistica Research Department, which began by stating, Between 1982 and November 2022, 73 out of the 137 mass shootings in the United States were carried out by white shooters. By comparison, the perpetrator was African American in 21 mass shootings and Latino in 11. When calculated as percentages, this amounts to 53%, 16%, and 8% respectively. Broadly speaking, the racial distribution of mass shootings mirrors the racial distribution of the U.S. population as a whole. I suspect it may well be true that the racial distribution of mass shooters does mirror the racial distribution of the U.S. population in general. But hold up a minute. The Statistica Research Department just said that there were 137 mass shootings in the U.S. between 1982 and 2022? That's a 40-year period, and there were only 137 mass shootings? That's just 3.4 mass shootings a year. And that can't possibly be right in a nation of more than 300 million people. I mean, for example, what about all the gang battles that result in mass shootings in urban settings? There's way more than three of those a year, and they result in multiple homicides in small spaces of time. And they're, not, they're obviously not being counted in these numbers. But why? Is it because gang battles tend to skew Hispanic or black rather than towards European ancestry? Even setting that issue aside, it seems incredible that there would only be 3.4 mass shootings per year in the U.S. given how often they appear in the news. It looks like these numbers are being somehow manipulated to achieve some kind of outcome. And I also found other people who were doing cook-your-own-numbers-at-home calculations that, again, looked like they were trying to skew things, but in the other direction, to amplify the percentage of Black and Latino shooters. So, I saw numbers going both ways, and I don't know which statistics to use. As Mark Twain once wrote, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. I don't believe statistics just because someone cites them, and I was not able to find a source that I could have confidence in. Maybe the FBI has uh, some comprehensive, absolutely fair, impartial number somewhere, though knowing the degree of politicization and the government and the FBI, I wouldn't count on it. But in any event, I was not able to find good numbers. However, the largest ethnic group in the United States is people who are white, meaning of European ancestry, and so it wouldn't be at all unreasonable to conjecture that this is the ethnic group the snipers belong to. You just need to not be wedded to that idea. Unfortunately, the media is all about pigeonholing people and promoting confirmation bias, and their promoting the idea that the shooters were likely white may have played a role here. This is something that Chief Moose even speculated about, He's saying that it could have affected not only the public, but the police as well. Did police officers, witnesses listen to the talking heads in the sense of it's a white male and just look right at Malvo and Muhammad but didn't see him? Some of these things we'll never know. And I agree, we can't really know the impact of what this was. But it's a cautionary lesson that we need to remember because the profile was wrong in this case and it can be wrong in the future. If we want to catch killers, we shouldn't be wedded to any profile that people come up with and we should be willing to consider killers who vary from a profile in different respects. What about the release of the information about Muhammad, Malvo, and the car once they had it? Was releasing that to the public a good decision? It was a gamble, and it certainly could have gone badly. What if the snipers, instead of being asleep in the car, had actually been awake, listening to the radio, driving, they hear the report, they ditch the car, they get another car, easily could have gone the other way. Fortunately, in this case, the gamble paid off, and Mohammed and Malvo were caught remarkably quickly. 
Uh, The press conference was at midnight, and Whitney Donahue spotted them just over an hour later. That's fast. I can't really second-guess people too much if you make a debatable judgment call and then it pays off, which it did in this case, for which we can all be thankful. Now, let's go for what may be the most perplexing question from the reason perspective. What was Muhammad and Malvo's motive? This is a tough one. Um, One of the early theories was that it had to do with Muhammad's wife, Mildred. He had come to the Washington, D.C. area where she lived, and then he started killing people. The proposal was that he was planning on killing her, but figuring that police wouldn't finger him if a lot of other people were killed first. That way, it would look like a random spree killer was responsible, not an embittered former husband. Another theory that should be considered is money. After all, Muhammad and Malvo did ask for $10 million, so on the face of it, money was a motive. On the other hand, the idea of extorting money, especially that much money, from the government to stop a spree killing is extremely implausible. You'd have to be crazy to think the government is just going to wire you $10 million. But maybe Muhammad was just crazy. Then there's the fact that Muhammad and Malvo were Muslim. And Muhammad had been radicalized by Islamic extremism. He reportedly made positive remarks about Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda after the 9-11 attacks. He even changed his name to Muhammad the month after the 9-11 attacks. So maybe Islamic terrorism was a motive. And maybe it wasn't just one motive. Maybe it was a combination of these coupled with Muhammad's anger. For his part, Muhammad didn't really clarify what, why they did what they did. Did Lee Malvo ever say anything about their motive? He said different things at different times. Uh, while in prison, he did some writing and drawing in which he referred to a jihad against the United States and said, I have been accused on my mission. Allah knows I'm going to suffer now. His drawings accompanying these writings include illustrations of figures like Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, and that could confirm the idea that this was inspired by the 9-11 attacks and was meant as some kind of follow-on terrorist campaign. On the other hand, uh, the drawings also include characters from the movie The Matrix, which Muhammad and Malvo were obsessed with, thinking of themselves as real-life versions of Morpheus and Neo. Thus, some dismissed the Muslim-themed illustrations, but I don't see the two sets of images as being in conflict. You can both be inspired by Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein and be inspired by Morpheus and Neo. In 2006, Muhammad was on trial and Malvo gave testimony, which contained his fullest set of claims about what the plan was. Wikipedia summarizes, Part of his testimony concerned Muhammad's complete plan with three phases in the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore metro areas. Phase one consisted of meticulously planning, mapping, and practicing their locations around the D.C. area so after each shooting, they could quickly leave the area on a predetermined path and continue to the next location. Muhammad's goal in phase one was to kill six white people a day for 30 days. Malvo described how Phase 1 did not go as planned due to heavy traffic and the lack of a clear shot or getaway routes. Phase 2 was meant to be undertaken in Baltimore, but was never carried out. It was to begin with the killing of a pregnant woman by a shot to the abdomen. The next step was to have been the killing of a Baltimore City police officer, and at the officer's funeral, to detonate improvised explosive devices that contained shrapnel to kill police officers attending the funeral. Phase 3 was to begin during Phase 2. It was to extort millions of dollars from the United States government. The money would be used to pay for travel to Canada, stopping en route at YMCAs and orphanages to recruit impressionable young boys with no parents or guidance. Once he recruited a large number of young boys and arrived in Canada, Muhammad would train the boys with weapons and send them across the United States to carry out mass shootings as he had done in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. So maybe that was the plan, but it's hard to know, since this also could be Malvo trying to make them sound big after they got caught. What ultimately happened to Muhammad and Malvo? 
They were both convicted on multiple counts. Uh, Muhammad received the death penalty, and he was put to death by lethal injection in 2009. He refused to make any statement before the penalty was administered, so he had no last words. Malvo has a more complicated legal history, in part because he was a juvenile at the time of the crimes, and different jurisdictions have different rules about whether you could apply the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole to someone who was a juvenile when they committed a crime. The laws also have changed in this regard since 2002, but currently Malvo is in prison, and currently, more than 20 years later, in 2023, there are still legal matters in progress to determine the final nature of his sentences. Now, what can we say about the Beltway shootings from the faith perspective? Obviously, murder bad. And mass murder extra bad. Uh, John Muhammad went to his death apparently unrepentant, but the good news is that Lee Malvo has apparently had a change of heart. By 2012, he was describing his former self as a monster and a ghoul. He says he's a different person now, not the same young man who terrorized the entire Washington region for nearly a month. I mean, I, I was a monster. If you look up the definition, I mean, that's what a monster is. I, I was a ghoul. I was a thief. I, I, I stole people's lives. Lee Boyd Malvo, convicted in the D.C. area sniper case, says he's truly sorry for what happened. His exclusive interview with the Washington Post comes on the 10-year anniversary of the shooting spree that left 10 people in the Washington region dead over the course of about three weeks. So it's good that he's had this realization, and we can hope he's sincere. We also can pray for him, for the soul of John Muhammad, and for all of their victims. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the D.C. Beltway sniper shootings? The D.C. Sniper Beltway shootings were an agonizing three week period. Law enforcement faced a massive challenge trying to sort through the avalanche of tips and catch them, but with careful sleuthing, they were able to put the pieces together and identify John Muhammad and Lee Malvo as the perpetrators. And with the help of a heroic refrigeration specialist, they were then caught almost immediately and brought to justice. And what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers on the subject? We'll have links to Angie Cannon's book, 23 Days of Terror, also information on the D.C. sniper attacks, the Beltway snipers, um, the, a 2013 BBC deranged killers documentary about the case, also a British final report documentary, uh, information about the Guardian Angels, that L.A. Times article explaining the duck in a noose fable the Unreliable Statistica article I mentioned, a uh, video of a story about uh, Lee Malvo being repentant, and also a video about a story of him uh, to be resentenced. All right, so that's it from us for this time. What are your theories about John Muhammad and Lee Malvo, the DC snipers? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world by visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or by calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work on this episode. You can check out the work they do by going to my YouTube channel and watching uh, a Mysterious World episode. The channel is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, and we're trying to get up to 40,000 subscribers now. I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get a notification when I release a video whether it's Mysterious World or one of the other videos I put out. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, I promised you that this episode we would discuss what is publicly known about the D.C. sniper shootings. But there is a whole nother side to them that is not publicly known, at least not commonly. So next week, we'll be telling you about a secret side of the investigation that almost nobody knows about that would blow many people's minds. 
I'm not going to say more than that for now, but it will be very surprising to a lot of people. So you don't want to miss it. Folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts to help us grow our community and reach more listeners. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 263. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit delivercontacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>